Hello my friends, John LaRuffy here with another Straight Up Solo. In this episode, we are going to give you a top 10 list for the top 10 best solo games, in my opinion, released in 2022. So this isn't necessarily the ones that uh, I bought in 2022 that were before released before earlier, because a couple of those I did buy that didn't make the list, because these were specific to ones that were released this year that I was able to acquire this year with some very minor exceptions. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into my top 10. Number 10 on this list is going to be Carnegie. This game is a fantastic uh, middleweight, middle to heavyweight European style game. I really appreciated the, uh, the, the tightness of the game, the mechanics, the fact that you were putting workers into certain strategies and investing in certain things to try to score, the fact that there was no way you could get everything done that you wanted to do. The uh, focus tracks were just way too big for that. Just a really good, I thought it was a fantastic game. Uh, now, there were some people who didn't like the fact that you only, you basically were limited to a specific number of each type of action in the game, but I think that's just fine. And I also found that the AI was not too difficult to run by any means. Overall, very pleasant experience, my number 10. I like Carnegie a lot, and I recommend it to anybody who likes that business-style theme game and is looking for a medium, medium-heavy solo. Number 9 is my one bare exception, but I did get this in 2022, and that's Arc Nova. So it wasn't available for me to be able to get until 22. So I know they were released in Essen in 21. I just couldn't get a handle on it. But I finally did get it from Capstone Games uh, during that time. And it was just a very fun, very rich and detailed tableau slash uh, uh, map builder, polyomial slash the longer you wait on the actions, the uh, stronger they get game, which I really liked. In essence... There was a ton of variety in what the cards would do. And you're trying to race to get two different point tracks to connect before you run out of time. So it is a, in the solo mode, it's a very non-intrusive solo mode because you're basically playing against a clock. But it does have a uh, defined wind or win condition, pardon me. And I just thought it was a great game. I thought it was a lot of fun. There's so many cards in there. There's so much content to explore. You can play with different um, zoo layouts and such, which change the strategy and what you're doing. Really a good game. I really enjoyed it. And that is my number nine, Arc Nova. Number eight. This is a reimagining of a game that came out years ago, and that is Sky Mines. So number eight, this was one where uh, Alexander Pfister really took something that he had done before and enhanced it substantially. There's a double board, like each of the boards, this is more of the classic board, but then there was this other one that changed the way the game worked. There were different scenarios in the game that uh, added different um, enhancements to what was you know, previously mechanics in uh, Mombasa. But the really cool thing about this game, in my opinion, was its tightness. You really felt like you had way much way more than you could accomplish and so in order to do it you really had to craft some very um well played and, and very strategic decisions that went from multiple turns because you could buy cards put them in a specific order plan for them you had to put them out of the order in order to get them back at a certain time and really that mechanic is is very rewarding to see when you do it well and you can have some really solid turns pushing yourself on the company tracks or expanding your company. It's just really a joy to play. I, I really like that game, and I, I very much enjoy that they redid it with a solo mode, which I think works fantastically. Now, some people want to play double solos and things like that, and you could actually do that if you printed out a, a, an additional set of cards if you want more competition. I don't feel like I needed that. There was enough already going on where I felt that I was uh, having a lot of fun with just me and the other solo in a two-player game. And you could, for my opinion, the, the secondary board definitely provided some tightness to things if you felt like the first one was more of just kind of a, 
a little flabbier of experience because of the competition on the company or the outpost placement. But I just love that game. That's a fantastic one. Anybody who's looking for a real meat and potatoes, solid. Um, I mean, it was definitely, I'd say, a medium heavy to heavy because of the decision space and the amount of turns you had to consider to really play it well. I just think it's a great game. Fantastic Fister offering. I really enjoyed it. All right. Number seven. This one I almost didn't get because I was so mad about <laughs> the, the company's delays in some of my other games that I had kickstarted from them. I didn't kickstart this one. I ended up buying it when it was actually in the stores. And it was funny because some people, I, I think it was a little bit divisive on some people really loved it or they hated it, but I really loved it. And that is Oak. So Oak is a worker placement game that had some extreme, I'd say constraints. Again, I keep saying constraints because you wanted to do so many things in this game, but there was so much preventing you from doing it which means you really had to put your thinking cap on to get there. What, what is an example of that? Well, you want to take a specific action, but in order to do so where you need to be, you have to have a certain amount of, of um, strength, I think, if I remember correctly. And in order to get that strength, you had to have you know one of these, these tracks rolled up in a certain spot where you could spend enough points to do it. But if that was blocked by the AI, then you had to come up with a different approach how to do it. Now, you could have a specific worker that would ignore some of the, the penalties for that blocking, um, but uh, but you may not have that. And then there was a lot of different strategies you could take. There was different um, tree tracks that you could go in the oak tree that would gain you a lot of points at the end. There were different deck building mechanics on what you could do, putting in a very, very small amount of cards, but when you upgrade those cards, they really allowed for some more poignant and and, uh, and potent turns. So Oak is just, to me, a really, really good example of dialing it up a notch with, you know, making, making it look like you could do everything, but really you can only afford to do certain things. And to, to get to those other things, you had to really suss out, what, what, what do I need to do to afford what I want to do. I just thought it was great. It was a lot of fun to play. I'm definitely keeping it for uh, my, you know, I don't ever see myself selling it. And each game, because there were specialties in the workers, I feel like you could try a different strategy with a couple of different combinations of those uh, workers and, and it really would change things. So I really liked Oak. I thought it was fantastic. Number six. Number six is my pick this year for um, the second best board and dice game in my list, okay? Because I have one more that I liked even more, but we'll get to that. But Tylitum was a real gem, and I'm not exactly sure why. I, I don't know why I love this game so much, except the fact that I just think it's just plain and simple fun. It is, in a lot of ways, simpler than some of their other games that they put down, Definitely simpler than Takanu, but it shares some of those um, those aspects. And I love Takanu, but I just really enjoy this game. I think that it's because of the clever dice and action selection where you have two competing situations. You have the situation of I need more resources versus the situation of I need more actions. And to balance those things out, I find, is a very, very fun puzzle. And then there's board placement. There's um, trying to get to certain places at a certain time to be able to maximize whatever the variable round scoring things are. Just a gem. I just I really like playing this game. I've actually played it multiplayer and solo. I like in both sides of things. And, you know, that says something because usually I play most things solo. But this one I wanted to teach people because I enjoyed it so much. The solo is not that tough to... Um, to activate, but it's harder than most. And I say that because the actual turns and the actions that the solo takes are different than what you do. So you do have to learn a separate game. Also, in order to make the solo competitive, I think, you have to add a bunch of condition cards, which is cool. I'm glad they did this. But that also adds specific changes to their rules where they do things in a different way. 
increasing the things you got to remember in your head. Now, they, they put it out in, in some card format, which is good. But it's just things that you have to do to say, okay, this is going to be a little bit more to, to run. So it's going to be a bit of a heavier overhead. So that is one thing that, you know, I thought, I wish they could have done, I wish the bot was a little bit more challenging without having to add all those different things, but that's okay. I mean, ultimately speaking, it's still a fantastic game. The solo mode works very well. It definitely blocks you and prevents you from doing things that you want to do. And, um, and it's, it's just fun to play. So that was my number six. Number five. This one was this year's release. Uh, from Shem Phillips, and without further ado, it is Wayfarers of the South Tigris. Now, Wayfarers of the South Tigris, to me, was one of these games that just has all sorts of stuff you can do. It's like a plethora of things. Now, the mechanics and such, I don't think there was anything brand new and novel. But what I did like and what made it so much fun is that there was such a variety of different actions you could take. You can play workers down on some of these cars to take certain actions. You can uh, take actions with your tapestry over here or your canvas. I think it was, I can't remember what it was, caravan, that, um, you know, flushed the dice in certain ways that would allow you to take things. You had to build a whole bunch of different tableaus. You had to try to make sure you're marching down this um, this journal track to both unlock scoring things and uh, as well gain benefits. There was multipliers here so you could double down on certain strategies. And um, you know, overall, the, the big complaint was the AI cheats. But I don't think the AI cheats. I just think the AI plays a different type of game. It doesn't use the same rules you do. And that's okay with me. I don't have any problems with that because the AI was, I mean, I'll put it this way, the AI blew me away, okay? So I've got a long way to be able to catch up and to figure out how to beat the AI. But I think it was fun regardless of that, just to play it. And, you know, it, it gives me that kind of feeling like I know there's got to be a way to get better to be able to best his score. I just haven't figured it out yet. But I really like Wayfarers. It was just a lot of fun. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of things you can do. And variety for me is important in games. And this one had tons of variety in the different ways you could go with the strategies and such. Really liked it. Okay, number four. This one was kind of a sleeper game for me. I wasn't expecting it. I didn't back it on Kickstarter. And one day I walk into my flags and there it is. And I'm lucky that they had the Sphinx edition. I might give it away which actually had the solo mode included, which I think would be one of the major, um, I'd say, strikes against the game. They should have put the solo mode in every single game. That's ridiculous that they would sell it that way, and people would be tricked about not having the solo mode included. But what I'm talking about is this gigantic game, Mosaic. Now, this is definitely one of the heaviest, and I'm talking about weight, <laughs> the heaviest games in my collection. It is not the heaviest game in my collection with regards to the kind of gameplay. Um, I don't say it's light, but it is not super heavy. So this one is a game that is somewhat 4X-like. I can't even get to the point where you can see it all. You are expanding and building a civilization, so to speak, on this map. You are also gaining a whole bunch of different cards that are, you know, I, I would say not super thematic in the way that they um, apply the technologies because they don't really, there's no real tech tree. It's all kind of there to work on. But yet it's just cool because there's so many different ways to approach the game and things you can focus on. I found it very fun to play. That's why it's my number four. I felt like there was a ton of content to explore. You're not going to get through all the different um, the different decks by any means in a single game, and and you you randomize a very very you know thick deck of of um, technology cards. I can't remember what they're really called, developments or whatever. But it was just a lot of fun. There's a lot of ways to score. There's a lot going on. It's a massive table hog, so be careful of that. Um, and I thought that the solo player worked really well too to provide a challenge and a good opponent in a, in a game that is tough to do solo, right? It's kind of tough. There's a lot of things that could happen. So the way they did it with the deck of cards, I thought was good. Um, it was competitive. 
And uh, it was just fun. I really like this game. I backed the expansion to it, which should provide even more variety um, and more things with regards to, I think, conflict. The war me mechanism, etc., was a little bit different than usual. You didn't have to really focus on it, and it wouldn't necessarily ruin your situation, but it could cost you a decent amount of points if someone goes heavy on it. The only, I think, thing that was tough with that is that it was somewhat circumstantial whether you could focus on it depending on the cards came out and such. Um, and that that was, I'd say, the, a little bit of a quibble because I didn't really have any problems with that, but I know some people did and they didn't like that approach. But I really like this game. It's definitely going to stick with me for a very, very, very long time. It's great to just get it out and just have a wide open experience. Now, I will say this. This is one of those games that isn't that constrained. You know, apart from other games that are civilization-based games, which, you know, I think about um, about how tight those types of games can be, this way you can really kind of dabble all over the place. And if you don't want, I mean, you're also like gaining, when you produce, you're gaining resources by potentially the 10s and the 20s and such. So you don't have to produce often. You produce once and you can really maximize on a certain thing and... And then, you know, use that production to fuel several turns, which I think is cool. And I like that because it's not like I have to constantly do what feels like a, a fill-in action just to keep my economy going. I, I, could, I can really pay attention to specializing in a few things, get all that stuff, and then invest all that stuff in a series of turns afterwards, which I think is fun. So Mosaic, A Story of Civilization, that's my number four. I really enjoy it. And... Uh, I just wish they had not had that that misstep and not putting the solo where it belonged, which is in every version of the game. Okay, number three. Now, number three was a very uh, sleeper hit also for me. It was the other board and dice game that I took from this year, and that is Terracotta Army. I really enjoyed the spatial puzzles and the variable scoring of Terracotta Army. There's a lot of interesting action selection mechanism. And once my brain finally wrapped around how the AI prioritizes things, it became much easier to play. It was definitely a very difficult first play, trying to figure out what the AI was doing and how it was doing it um, with regards to where does it place and what's the optimal move and what would it choose to do. Once you get the experience with the game, you don't have to really refer to all those rules of the ifs, thens a lot because it's just logical what they're going to focus on when you understand the spirit of what is driving them. You still have to do some of the things to remember, you know, what their preferences are going to be with regards to how are they going to pick certain units to play and weapons, etc. But once you get that down, it really kind of moves at a good clip. And this game, I think, is just really clever because it's just fun to to try to adapt with the both the moving of the inspectors as well as the curveballs that the AI is going to throw at you. And what they do in that regard is at the end of the, each round of the of five rounds, I believe, they will potentially, if you see their resources stacking up, you know they're going to build and they're going to do some last minute building, which could really mess up your plans. And I think that's just cool. It's, it's, it, it throws some things because it, it makes it so that it's not quite as, I mean, you can kind of see it coming, but not quite as predictable. Um, it, it gives you the feeling like you are playing against somebody else who might change their, their um, MO at uh, the last minute and try to you know, best you in that inspection and take the seven points and you only get the couple. I just really like this game. It's a lot of fun. I can't um, say it'll be for everybody because... It is a specific, it's all focused on one massive, um, you know, majority kind of scoring. Uh, whether it's the goals or whether it's the inspections in the different lines, it's all based on that. And some people like that or some people won't. I really found that I like that a lot. It isn't something, area majority and stuff like that is not something that I always would say, oh yeah, that's my favorite game or favorite type of game. I usually think that's okay but I'm not a huge fan except for this game I just think that that puzzle is extremely intriguing plus the different types of moves you can make in the game to put warriors in different spots that do different things with different abilities I think is, is fantastic it's very enjoyable for me so I really like Terracotta Army that is my number three and gets the bronze 
for this year's top solo game for me of 2022. Okay, what is the silver? This was the toughest choice between silver and gold for me with regards to 2022. And I'm going to give the silver to a game that was so heavy and difficult, it took me hours and hours and hours to figure out. But once I finally figured it out, <laughs> after I did a botched solo playthrough, which a lot of people helped me understand the mistakes I was making, which I appreciated, I've come to really enjoy this game, and I've come to really enjoy the cerebral uh, experience of trying to win and failing to win at this game. And I'm talking about the Vitel Lacerda release of Weather Machine. Now, pun intended, this thing stormed in. I backed it a long time ago, and this guy looked cool from the onset, right? It just looks complex and heavy and cool. There's so much going on. The artwork is so good. There's so much density here. This is definitely not going to be for everybody. But I can tell you it is for me, and it is for me with spades. I think they did a great job taking a very strange, weird theme and making a game about it. They didn't do such a good job in making it intuitive because it is so strange and weird. It's not intuitive like some of the other VTEL games like Kanban. You're building a car, you develop the car, you have to test the car. You kind of know that. Here, it's just all sorts of different stuff. You've got a government track, you've got a, what you're doing in the lab, you've got doing experiments, which all sort of makes sense, but... How they interact and the way that the turns work is very difficult to figure out. No doubt about it. This game had the biggest learning curve and is clearly a 5 out of 5 in complexity from my standpoint. And then when you add in doing the solo, it is very difficult because the solo player takes different actions in different spaces than you do. They don't go through the same procedures. So it does take a lot of learning. And I have committed myself to playing this on a regular basis so they don't forget how to play but it's it's just a joy to play i think it is really cool how all of it works together even though if i can't couldn't quite understand it at the beginning and it's it just looks good it is very strategic um there's you know i would think about the only the tactical elements are how the different um things come out in the lab as far as what you're going to work on but the rest of it you really can decide Okay, I have to prevent these things from happening. So when they happen, I got to do this and this and this. All right, I'm going to work on this strategy. Oh, shoot. The AI has, you know, worsened the weather over here. I have now have to have to put this out, this fire out, before I automatically lose the game so I can try to get back into a situation where I can be competitive point-wise. And I have not come close to winning yet. But that is a fun thing for me. I love the challenge of having to try to figure out how am I going to beat this game? How am I going to win against this AI who is, is just trying to thwart me at every single juncture? Weather Machine to me is definitely a clear silver. I really enjoyed it, but it is not for everybody. You have to want to have a big, heavy lift on this. But if you do, I think it's worth it if that's the kind of game you like. And finally, my gold, my favorite game of the year that came out, from 2022 is Twilight Inscription. So this one, I just think it's plain simple fun to play. The variety here is huge. The fact that you have eight different boards uh, that you can mix and match and combine, you have a different play every time. Now, the, the cards, the way the cards come out, they are somewhat, I mean, the rounds are somewhat predictable, right? Because each round is going to have a certain type of cards in there. But that doesn't mean that the game is um, on rails. Because of the way that you swap out the goals, you swap out the cards, you swap out um, the, the different player powers and the different boards in different configurations, there's just a ton of variety here. And I think it's just really, really fun. Now, the solo player is not an automa. It's kind of a ramping up scoring machine which I don't have any problems with whatsoever. But some people who want to feel like they're doing a little more of that Automa experience, there I, I've heard there are other ways on Board Game Geek um, 
that uh, people have built that in. But I'm totally fine with the way it is. I like the way it is. And sometimes if it ain't broke, don't fix it for you, folks. And it's and that's a good thing to remember no matter what. Whether you're watching my channel or somebody else, just because I like something or I prefer something, do whatever works for you. If you house rule something or you enjoy it and the way it is, and maybe it's not the most complex of the variants, but it makes it fun for you to play, I that's that's the way I look at it. And I, once I've found something I like, you know, I'm, I'm happy to stick with it. Sure, maybe I'll dabble here and there and see if see if something else is different than I like the other, the other way. But for me, this game just offers an amazing amount of variety, some tough choices. The fact that when you play well, you can really ramp up your score. And if you play mediocre with a... It's, it's not a point salad in the way that um, I just do things. I score points all the time and I got to get a decent score. Like... If you just play this game like a point salad, you'll have a crappy score, which will not be competitive. If you focus and chain things together and really pay attention to what you're doing and stay disciplined in what you're doing, you'll have a very strong score. And I like that too, because that rewards smart play. And that, I think with the variety and also the, I, I would say that the, the length, it doesn't take more than an hour. It's probably 45 minutes to play if you're paying attention as a solo player. This one just edged out Weather Machine just a little bit because I think ultimately, while Weather Machine is a little more rewarding experience overall when you do play well, this one's just a smidge more fun. But these, you know, really the, the top three, all the games, it was really hard for me to make, um, you know, the, the ranking in the last uh, five or six to know which ones were my favorite for 2022. But... I think just in general, this was a bumper crop of a year, and I didn't even speak on some of the um, the expansions that came out that made good games already better. You know, the expansion for Takanu made a great game even better. The expansion for Taiwan TCU made a great game even better. And there was a lot, I mean, the expansions for Clinic took that game, Clinic Deluxe was already packed, and then it exploded it with even more. I mean, you could play Clinic forever without doing the same thing twice because there's so much mixing and matching you could do. And I didn't put that in here uh, just because I didn't want to cover expansions, but there was great stuff there. So I hope that whatever you decided to play this year, you had a fantastic year in solo gaming like I did. I hope this list was informative. If you haven't tried some of these games, maybe you take a look at them. And if you have... Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear what you think. Regardless, I'm interested to see what were your favorite ones uh, this year. What did you enjoy in 2022? And uh, we'll see how it goes. I hope everybody has a fantastic um, 2023 as we get into the new year. And I've, I appreciate all the support that everybody's given me this year with your subscriptions and your thumbs up and your likes and your comments. It's been awesome. It's been an awesome community. And you guys have done a great job making me feel appreciated for uh, for this hobby that I do and the work I do to put these videos out. Thank you very much. It means a ton to me. So without further ado or for any more delays, whatever you decide to play in the future, I hope you have a fantastic time doing it. Happy New Year, everybody, and take it easy.